The title of my talk today is Remembrance, Redressal, and Responsibility. When I was a young man, I read a novel. I didn't know it at the time, but it was to have a profound impact on me in many ways. And it would go on to inform my writing several years later the name of the book, it's a very well-known book, is 100 Years of Solitude, and it's by the Nobel laureate Gabriel Garcia Marquez. It's a fabulous book, but the one aspect that I want to talk about today is relevant to um, the occasion that we have gathered to commemorate. In his book, the author refers to a massacre of banana company workers in an anonymous Latin American republic. The massacre is terrible. The workers who are agitating for better pay and better conditions are brutally murdered by a militia at the behest of the banana company that owns the plantations that they work at. As terrible as the massacre itself, and as gross an injustice, is the systematic erasure of the massacre from collective memory. That is what stayed with me for decades after I read the book. As we gather together to mark the 37th anniversary of the terrible tragedy in Delhi and several other places in India in the aftermath of Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. It's interesting to ponder for a second that to this day, even we six sometimes inadvertently refer to the events of 1984 as the quote unquote Delhi riots. This is a triumph of propaganda and a triumph of semantics where a term that connotes a disturbance is used to describe something that we know today was nothing other than an organized massacre. Remembrance thus is tremendously important in my work, as I traveled around the world with the play Kultar's Mind that Siddhar Pratap Singh Ji had referred to, I witnessed firsthand the lack of knowledge about the events of 1984, particularly among the generations that were born after the events. Not a surprise. After all, this is history that is not documented in history books. Nobody has a stake in talking about it. So the net result is that when you look at the population of, if you step back and look at the population of India, 1984, the horrific events of Delhi and elsewhere have been fading from collective memory. And we cannot afford that. Many people on this call today are my age or maybe a little older people who had experienced the events of 1984 either firsthand or were alive when they occurred. You will never forget. But what about the generations to come? Who is going to educate them? That is why remembrance is tremendously important. And it begs the question, how do we remember? Well, events like the one that we are participating in today are tremendously important and they play a part. Even more important, I would posit, is the creation of art that talks about 1984 in a forthright manner. All of us know about the horrors of partition. Hundreds upon hundreds of books have been written, including academic tomes that bulge with statistics. However, I will tell you that as someone born long after partition, the one work that really informs my understanding of the tragedy of partition and its enormity 
is Sardar Khushwant Singh's slim novel, Train to Pakistan. Those of you who have read it will know exactly what I'm talking about. That is why it is tremendously important for Sikhs and non-Sikhs to create art, whether it's literature, whether it's poetry, whether it's film, whether it's theater, about 1984, that is one way in which we keep this tragedy alive in the collective consciousness. And why that is important, I will address at the end of my talk. The act of remembering in itself However, it can be controversial. When my daughter and I started creating Kultar's Mime and we made plans to bring it to India, a lot of my well-wishers asked me if I was crazy. Why do you want to do this? 30 years have passed. Why don't you forgive and forget? Are you trying to get people excited? Do you want to create a desire for revenge among young Sikhs? These were all questions that were asked. It is important for us to be prepared to answer these questions in a very, very effective manner. And I'll give you my perspective in two parts. The first part is informed by the very nature of who we are and how we live our lives. In our Ardas, which all of you participate in, oftentimes, multiple times in a single day, what do we do? We commemorate the lives and honor those innocents who perished in the tumultuous times that the Sikh Panth went through in the 18th century. So if somebody asks me, why do you keep talking about 1984? Why do you keep harping about the victims of 1984? My answer as a Sikh is that as a Qom, we have not forgotten the tyranny of Zakriya Khan. We have not forgotten the brutality of Mir Mannu. We have not forgotten the depredations of Basarangar. We have not forgotten the massacres that were perpetrated by Lakhpat Rai and Ahmad Shah Abdali. Why then will we forget the massacre that was perpetrated by the powers that ruled India in 1984? It is our nature to remember just as it is appropriate to remember those innocents who perished in the 18th century in our Ardas every day, it is equally appropriate and necessary to remember those innocents who perished, not because of anything that they did or didn't do, but simply because of who they were. Let's talk about redressal. What does redress look like 37 years after the fact? HKL Bhagat is dead. Nobody can touch him now. We know who the perpetrators were. We cannot let despair and apathy take over. I have no words to express my admiration for Fulkaji who has been fighting this fight often alone for decades. But make no mistake, this is not just his fight. And furthermore, this is not just our fight. This is everyone's fight because 1984 is but one in a series of terrible instances of sectarian violence that have existed for millennia and show no signs of going away. So our fight for justice has to be about much more than the victims of 1984, but that is an excellent starting point because we understand those events, we are affected by those events, and we have motivation to deal with these events. What can we do? 
after endless commission after commission has been absolutely ineffectual and has really not delivered any kind of justice. Well, what we can do is, first of all, we never let the nation forget what its apparatus and machinery perpetrated 37 years ago. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we have to relentlessly, relentlessly talk about what happened and who did what. And I don't need to preach to the choir. All of you are aware of this. Today we know that there were reports that were published by the PUCL and the PUDR that named names, that specifically talked about who the perpetrators were. There was reporting by many, including Madhu Kishwar, that fearlessly talked about what happened in Delhi. I would say that even if the Bhagats of the world are dead, we have to make sure that even their memory and their legacy Whenever anybody talks about H.K.L. Bhagat, the first thing that should come to mind should be what he did in 1984. And that applies to Jigdish Teitler and everybody else who was named in these reports. We have to be specific. We have to be, we have to be relentless. And we have to be absolutely strident in our demand for justice. Why? Because that's who we are. What do we need? What does redressa look like? The very first thing that we need is acknowledgement. Dismissing the events of 1984 as a riot is a travesty and we should not stand for it. We need acknowledgement from the powers that rule India that 37 years ago, the government perpetrated this, the government was culpable, we need acknowledgement, we need an apology. Only then can there be any talk of catharsis. And until we get to catharsis, there can absolutely be no healing. I discovered this firsthand when I journeyed with Gultar's mind around the world. Every performance included survivors people who had been directly affected by the tragedy or had relatives who were affected by the tragedy. It was patently clear that there is no forum today for a conversation about 1984. We have buried the PTSD and the trauma deep. There is relentless pressure on us to forgive and forget. There is relentless pressure on us to move on. We cannot succumb to that pressure. Let's talk about forgiveness for a second, because I absolutely subscribe to the fact that it is an essential ingredient of healing. Yes, someday we will get to forgiveness. We must, because if we don't forgive, we are never going to heal. Let's talk about forgiveness for a second in the Sikh tradition. Forgiveness is something that we all understand and the lives of our gurus abound with examples of their forgiving people who have meant them grievous harm. I will talk about one instance that speaks to me tremendously. Several of you would be aware of Guru Hargobind Sahib's life in particular, I want to talk about a follower of Guru Hargobin Sahib, a Pathan named Bende Khan, who was lovingly nurtured by the Guru to the point that his Sikhs became jealous because the Guru showered so much love and blessing on Bende Khan, and Bende Khan grew up to become one of the Guru's most fearless warriors. To keep the story short, Bende Khan rebelled against the Guru he fought against the Guru and the Guru in one-on-one one -on -one combat wounded Pende Khan mortally. I'm going to quote a few lines from the Gurbilas Pashahi Chemi. Kaha Guru Khalsa, Kaha Guru, Kaha Guru Kalma Paro Pende Girit Alaye, 
हे गुरु मिले सो तेग तुम कलमा रूप सुहाए ऐस सुनत मन मोह उपजायो श्री गुरु नैन नीर भर आयो छाया करी ढाल के साथ गुर सम कोई न दीना नाथ तैसे गुर छाया करी अपने रूप समाए निज आंसू मुख धोए ते नाम नरन समझ गाए द टाइम फॉर यू टू गो इज ड्रॉइंग नाय द टाइम फॉर यू द कलमा टू रिसाइट द खान कंट्राइट ही इज नाउ हर्ट टू से माई कलमा लोर्ड योर ब्लेड दैट डिड मी स्माइट his master's heart now fills with love his tender eyes they well with tears the guru's shield o cooling shade fount of mercy bane of fears in the shade of master's warm embrace on his face fall soothing tears of grace everything that we do has to be informed by the lives of our gurus and by the examples that they set for us if guru hargobind sahib could forgive pende khan surely there has to be a time when we will be able to forgive the perpetrators of 1984 but there is a but why was pende khan forgiven pende khan was forgiven because he said oh guru your sword is my kalma Pande Khan asked for forgiveness. Pande Khan understood that he had done wrong. Pande Khan acknowledged it. The day we get acknowledgement, we can start thinking about forgiveness and healing. Until then, the fight has to be relentless. Finally, let me talk about responsibility. The task of remembering the task of fighting for redressal does not come without responsibility what do i mean by that we have to avoid the trap of hatred we have to avoid the pitfalls of looking for revenge because sometimes when we deal with issues that are this emotionally charged the dividing line between justice and revenge can get very very thin as we strive to remember as we strive to seek redressal we have to do it with a tremendous sense of responsibility how do we do this by being specific living in the diaspora i am particularly sensitive to this because sometimes our younger children the younger generations who were born in the diaspora and view india and indians exclusively through the lens of 1984 can often fall into this trap of hatred we cannot allow that the reason why we cannot allow that is our gurus told us better they taught us better If you look at the examples from the lives of every guru let's focus for a second on Guru Gobind Singh ji who lost his entire family to the Mughals did he ever express hatred towards them he was unequivocal in his quest for justice but did anything that he ever did even look remotely like revenge I am asking a rhetorical question he did not and that's the path that we have to walk we have to be relentless in our quest for justice but we cannot fall prey to emotions that take us towards hatred or revenge because if we do then we would not be walking the path that the gurus laid in front of us laid out for us to walk i will finish my talk by going back to guru nanak sahib everything in sikhi can be traced to guru nanak sahib how guru nanak sahib dealt with tyranny and violence needs to inform how we deal with tyranny and violence 
ਸਿੰਘ ਬੁਕੇ ਮਿਰ ਕਾਵਲੀ ਪੰਨੀ ਜਾਏ ਨਾ ਤੀਰ ਤਰੋਆ ਅਪਨ ਦ ਮਾਈਟੀ ਲਾਇਨਸ ਰੋਰ ਰੈਸਟਲੈਸ ਡੀਅਰ ਫਲੀ ਐਵਰ ਮੋਰ ਪਾਈ ਗੁਰਦਾਸ ਜੀ ਰਿਫਰਸ ਟੂ ਗੁਰਨਾਨਕ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਐਸ ਅ ਰੋਰਿੰਗ ਲਾਇਨ ਵੀ ਵੰਡਰ we could think of guru gobind singh as a roaring lion but guru nanak sahib as a roaring lion well he was i go back to the cry of anguish that guru nanak sahib uttered that sardar ravinder singh ji referred to in his introduction which we know today as babarbani which is in the sri guru granth sahib that roar of anguish was also a roar of mercy and a roar of compassion and that very roar of mercy and compassion almost 200 years later manifested itself in the physical form of the kirpan that we carry so proudly today let us ponder the legacy of guru nanak sahib when he roared When Guru Nanak Sahib fearlessly confronted Babur after the sack and carnage at Sayyidpur he was not articulating the pain of his followers he was not articulating the pain of his family he was articulating the pain of humanity if there is any lesson that we are going to learn from Guru Nanak Sahib's cry that is the lesson that we have to learn and it is very relevant to our remembrance of 1984 today and in the future why because 1984 was not an isolated incident either in the context of global history and definitely not in the context of indian history the scourge of sectarian violence lives with us today there were 1984s before 1984 godra was another 1984 2 years ago when the shaheen bag agitation was going on we could see the makings of another 1984 which was preempted by the pandemic so the point is that just as gurunanak saheb con- did not confine himself to addressing the pain of his followers he talked about the pain of hindu women high born and low born quote unquote he talked about the pain of muslim women that is how we need to learn to express pain i would posit that as important as it is for us to cry out in anguish about 1984 it is more important to cry out in anguish when somebody else is injured or attacked in that manner that's the only way in which we can preempt these things happening again i finish with a tra- with my translation of a shabad from babarbani in the interest of time i won't read the entire shabad i'll read mostly the translation ਰਾਗ ਆਸਾ ਮਹਲਾ ਪਹਿਲਾ ਅਸ਼ਟਪਦੀਆਂ ਘਰ ਤੀਜਾ ਇਕ ਓੰਕਾਰ ਸਤਗੁਰ ਪ੍ਰਸਾਦ ਜਿਨ ਸਿਰ ਸੋਹਣ ਪੱਟੀਆਂ ਮੰਗੀ ਪਾਏ ਸੰਧੂਰ ਸੇ ਸਿਰ ਕਾਤੀ ਮੁੰਨਿਅਣ ਗਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਵੇ ਧੂੜ ਮਹਲਾ ਅੰਦਰ ਹੁੰਦੀਆਂ ਹੁਣ ਵਹਿਣ ਨਾ ਮਿਲਣ ਹਦੂਰ ਆ ਦੇਸ ਬਾਬਾ ਆ ਦੇਸ ਆਦ ਪੁਰਖ ਤੇਰਾ ਅੰਤ ਨਾ ਪਾਇਆ ਕਰ ਕਰ ਦੇਖੇ ਵੇਸ heads that were with braids adorned hair partings that were painted red heads that now heads have now been roughly shaved dust chokes every throat and head the ones that dwelt in palaces banished they have mansions fled my lord to you i do now turn mysterious lord they are your ways through your will the world does burn surely on you surely on this is your gaze comely each bride that was wed every groom was dashing to palanquins did bring them here ivory clad their arms in view with love they were welcomed bright and sparkling fans a slew brides were greeted with such joy showered each with presents fair delicacies they were fed beds luxurious for them there now around their necks are ropes 
pearls are scattered everywhere. The flush of youth and riches great, each is a curse upon them now. Taken by the lackeys of the king, their virtue save not anyhow. What pleases him shall come to pass, demean he will or honor allow. Had they not lost their purpose, would not be punished they. Enmeshed in comfort pleasures, hedonists they lost their way. In this time of barber's blight, hungry they are sure to stay. Muslim women kept from prayer, can't to the temple Hindus go. Wither hearths that once were pure, ablutions they no longer know. Did not Ram in their hearts dwell, love for Allah cannot show. The few that have the carnage survived, congregate, seek comfort, they commiserate and bemoan their fate. They weep and mourn in every way that you will shall come to pass. Humans, Lord, they hold no sway. Thank you.